I think it's quite uh, ironic that I've been asked to refute the title of the, <laughs> of the entire conference, but we're going to do it together. Um, my name is Jeff Gomez. I'm the CEO of Starlight Runner. Um, uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, talking today um, about um, how narrative impacts gamification and vice versa. Um, and um, uh, uh, this is a talk that I've only just started to, uh, to deliver, so bear with me as I, uh, as I plunge forward. <laughs> um, um, uh, I'm a New Yorker. Can you tell from my accent? <laughs> um, and, uh, and I grew up in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, in Manhattan, and um, uh, uh, it was rough, man. It was, uh, it was difficult. The, um, uh, the whole world around me seemed to not just indulge in conflict, but thrive on it. Um, and I was <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> um, uh, here I am, a, a kind of nerd uh, who, who loved uh, fairy tales and dinosaurs and cartoons in a world where people were smashing each other's faces in for entertainment uh, on TV, not to mention what was going on outside on the streets. Um, uh, I was drawn to a certain kind of story, the kind that lasts, <laughs> because these, uh, these short form uh, uh, things that you saw on TV, they were done in about half an hour, maybe an hour, and then I was uh, back in reality, and that's a place that I didn't really want to hang out in uh, uh, very much. So um, I, I found myself drawn to these um, uh, uh, Japanese anime and epic fantasy uh, movies that had multiple sequels. Um, I, I loved that stuff, not just because it was long, but because it was serious and it took the audience uh, uh, seriously. Um, uh, so. Uh, I, 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 as I became a teenager, I kind of walked the streets of New York City in my leather jacket, uh, zits all over my face, a long, uh, uh, greasy hair, um, going to uh, see uh, uh, quintuple features in Times Square of every kung fu movie ever made. Um, and, um, and I loved it. Um, I, I loved not just um, uh, the escape of it, I, I love the fact that in the dark, um, uh, with an audience of very enthusiastic minorities, um, we, we yelled at the screen. And, um, and the screen almost felt like it was yelling back at us. There was an interplay, um, a, a kind of energy that was moving through the theater that sometimes erupted in a brawl. But, but often uh, uh, just um, uh, was, was a thrilling entertainment experience. Um, as I got older um, uh, and had some troubles, but we'll not discuss too much. If you want to do it after, we, we can talk about that. Um, uh, I, I had to find a way to kind of anchor myself and stay in story. And I discovered a way to do that was by playing... Um, uh, fantasy role-playing games, these tabletop adventure games, Dungeons and Dragons, I, I hope all of us understand what that is. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that I think somehow allowed for me to excel at this, to, to kind of um, instill my imagination um, uh, beyond playing with dinosaurs in the bedroom um, was um, the, the fact that um, uh, as a defense mechanism, the way that I survived those years in, in the city was through observation, threshold assessment, being able to walk into a room and know exactly who was likely to smash me in the face. Um, and. Um, uh, uh, in doing so, I was able to pick up little ticks, little personality quirks, little interesting things about people that I could take and weave into my discussion or my Dungeons and Dragons stories. So when you came and played in a Dungeons and Dragons game with me, you weren't just taking on a role and battling monsters. Your desires, your aspirations, your fears, um, your fantasies um, were absorbed by me and integrated into the, the narrative of the game. And, um, and I did that whether you knew it or not, 
or whether you liked it or not. <laughs> and what happened was uh, I got the, this intense response. My players loved it. They stuck around. Um, and in fact, there were times where I was running these games with 10 people, 15 people, even 20 people, and people coming in to watch because of how dramatic these, uh, these uh, uh, stories were unfolding. I was a real fast um, uh, 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 dungeon master. Is this nerdy or what? Well, you're all nerds. <laughs> you're all nerds. <clears throat> <laughs> I started to write about uh, these experiences, and, um, and I actually self-published a magazine called Gateways in the 1980s. By the way, that was on a Mac Plus with 512K of memory. Um, uh, it, it was what, how we got that done. I don't know, but um, but uh, companies like FASA and um, and Wizards of the Coast and TSR began to. Um, uh, uh, send me covers, artwork, and, um, and loved that I was talking about the game designers as if they were uh, rock stars, storytellers. And, um, and uh, in doing so, I eventually got invited to start writing uh, adventure games. I wrote uh, <laughs> fantasy games like Adventures in the Northern Wilderness and uh, Robotech and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, in the late 80s, uh, some of my friends began to um, uh, experiment with these things that looked like televisions taped to typewriters with telephone wire sticking out of the back of them. I would say, what is that? And they would say, well, uh, Jeff Gomez, the dungeon master, has other things to do, apparently. So we're going to play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, on the DARPA net <laughs> and, and um, uh, through these things called bulletin boards. And I said, well, can someone explain this? You mean you're actually dealing with people who are not in the room, who are somewhere else in the country playing these games? And, um, and they said yes and, and went on and on, as we nerds do, <laughs> uh, explaining this. Um, but uh, I faded out of that and, and looked at this, and all I could see was that that text eventually would be replaced by images, that black and white would be replaced by color, um, and suddenly there was, um, uh, David Bowie put it best when he called it the gray space in the middle. So here I am in 1988, 89, seeing the fact that uh, in the near future, maybe not that near, <laughs> um, there would be a screen there would be the audience in the seats, but somehow there was this, this space in between where you can get up and start messing around in it, and where the stuff on the screen can almost like come off and mess around with you. That was awesome. That blew me away. I knew somehow that that gray space in the middle was going to be where I was going to play. So when I went on to uh, join uh, Acclaim Entertainment um, out in Glen Cove, Long Island with uh, Valiant Comics as its uh, intellectual property uh, battery, um, I didn't just want to uh, develop comic books and video games. I wanted for the, um, uh, uh, the stories, the backstories, to be published on this new thing called the web. And um, uh, I wanted the, um, uh, the comic books to tie in canonically with the uh, uh, events of the game. Um, and, um, and also, when I talked in the press about these things that I was inventing, um, I gave away my email address, which probably in retrospect was stupid. Uh, but I, I got tens of thousands of, of emails. By the way, those websites crashed from so many people interested in finding out the backstory of Turok. And, and uh, in the process, which was a kind of little gamification, they would, fi they would get the cheat codes <laughs> if, they, if they read through enough of that backstory. Um, uh, uh, so, um, I started to do pretty good um, uh, with this multi-platform uh, uh, storytelling. Uh, late in my stint in, at Acclaim, I was approached by uh, John Lack, who went on to uh, uh, help develop uh, MTV's uh, interactive component. He said, uh, we want to uh, take this concept of the massively multiplayer online game and, um, and put it into a set-top box 
so that you can, the same box that allows you to watch uh, uh, HBO and, and things like that on top of the TV, we want to be able to, to run games off of. This is 97, 98. Um, uh, what do you think of this? What do you think of this possibility? Check out the game we want to emulate, Ultima Online. Um, and I did. And um, uh, of course, I, I love that sort of stuff, and it was interesting, but it wasn't giving me the hit that, um, that Dungeons and Dragons was giving me. And I, I figured out why. Um, there were hundreds or even thousands of people on, on Ultima Online who were just kind of milling about, waiting to get killed. <laughs> and um, and you, you couldn't really save the world. Um, uh, that was um, uh, going to kind of evolve slowly and involve hundreds and hundreds of, of people. Um, uh, in fact, the only person who was a player who was famous on Ultima Online was the dude who figured out a bug in the system and was able to kill Lord British, the, uh, the avatar of the guy who created the game. Um, <laughs> um, it wasn't flying, and I said, you know, there, there's got to be a different way to do massively multiplayer online games that allow me to feel validated and celebrated for my uh, participation. That would require a kind of rethinking the entire architecture of massively multiplayer online games. And the answer to me from John Lack was, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so that got tucked away. Uh, I went on to form, in 2000, Starlight Runner Entertainment uh, using the concept of multi-platform narrative, what we call transmedia storytelling, um, to, to kind of uh, be the glue in between different extensions of fabulous uh, uh, entertainment story worlds. Um, uh, what I mean is that um, uh, we see um, uh, these fantasy and science fiction properties um, almost the same way you would the Marvel or DC Universe, a kind of canonical story world where each piece of the world um, counts, where it actually kind of really happened and is a part of a grander uh, a puzzle. Um, this allowed me to, uh, it caught on. People wanted this because each little piece became more valuable, more sought after by the audience. And, um, uh, uh, and so it became a kind of trend. In fact, we helped the Walt Disney Company to understand that doing this, um, uh, interconnecting your movies and your TV shows and your comic books, um, uh, 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 kind of strengthened the franchise and, um, and allowed uh, uh, for the way that they think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Star Wars to <coughs> proliferate across the company as quickly as, as it did. Um, so we were doing okay, not bad. Um, uh, we, we adapted it to, to big brands like uh, Coca-Cola, um, uh, television, video games like Halo, and, and so forth. Um, in, in more recent years, um, uh, our, our client, the Walt Disney Company, uh, came to us and they said, you know, um, we'd like you to come to our, our parks and resorts um, uh, uh, division where we have a challenge. <laughs> and, um, and I said, okay, sure. And, uh, and I went there, and, um, and they explained to me that some data was coming through that indicated that young people's experience of Universal's wizarding world was much more intense, much more satisfying than Disney World um, or, or Disneyland or any of the parks. This was really puzzling to them. The Wizarding World is tiny compared to these massive uh, uh, parks. What's going on? Um, uh, what is the, uh, the difference? That's one IP. The Walt Disney Company has dozens and dozens of intellectual properties at uh, 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 Disney World. So I got them to spring for me to go to the Wizarding World, which is cool. <laughs> and I experienced like everything. And then I went to the, the Disney theme parks and I said, show me absolutely everything, which is really cool because you get to go in the tunnels underneath and see how it all works and, and so forth. Um, uh, I, I kind of fairly quickly realized what the issue was. Um, 
when they built these parks um, in, in the uh, 50s, 60s, um, uh, movies were, were kind of still very, very special, a, a, a rarity, a scarcity. You almost got, you kind of got dressed up to go to the movies and see a Disney movie. And when that movie left the theater, you weren't going to see it again, right? Uh, not for years and years until it, it got on uh, a television. So um, uh, the parks became a place where you could re-experience these, um, these movies, these amazing uh, movies, and that was very special. Um, but now, the, uh, the parks are jammed with um, intellectual properties that we know everything about and that we possess in our back pockets. Um, so we're, we're kind of seeing something that's super familiar. Um, uh, everything kind of parades past us at, at Disney and, um, and it's kind of re-summarized. I couldn't tell you how many times I heard, let it go, <laughs> let it go, <laughs> hundreds of times walking through that park. Um, uh, so uh, I noticed that that if you got to the park, you had to decide where you were going to go, and if you had people with you who didn't want to be there, there was nothing for them because the parks had this kind of super subspeciality depending on where you were, and the kid had to wait. Um, these lines uh, sometimes were endless. There's nothing to do while you're standing on them. Um, uh, I talked to kids who said, well, I, I can't touch these things. I'm not allowed. I can't talk to them. They won't talk back. Um, I can't play with them. Um, uh, and, um, and once you have experienced the whole thing, the only thing you can really do is kind of re-experience it again. Um, and it's basically the same thing. Uh, there was li little to drive you from one part of the park to the next, to the next, to the next. So um, I, I uh, asked uh, Disney a, a series of questions. Um, I said, would it be possible for the parks to be extensions of the story worlds of your intellectual property? Um, can, can there be ways to incentivize exploration of these worlds where we can promote a deeper sense of participation? Um, uh, can we discover something new about these worlds? Can we become the heroes of our experience without necessarily killing something or saving the world? That's a little difficult if you're running around a, a theme park. Um, can downtime be used to solve mysteries, discover new content? Um, can we talk, touch, and play with the story world? Can there be layers of narrative ripe for re-exploration? Can narrative threads be used and woven through the whole park for us to uh, follow? Um, and um, uh, they kind of looked at me funny uh, and, um, and said to me, well, nothing that you're saying sounds impossible, just really, really difficult to do. Let's talk about it. Um, so uh, I, I went back to Starlight Runner and Disney wasn't the only company um, uh, uh, experiencing this challenge. All of uh, the, the clients of Starlight Runner were grappling with story and with how to present themselves in a world that has changed so radically. So for centuries, every agency, company, studio, and writer has relied on the hero's journey narrative as a standard for storytelling. But nonlinear trans-platform communication has disrupted that model. Uh, to rising generations, the standard tropes of classic storytelling have begun to feel slow, obvious, and dated. We're yearning for a more dynamic and participative approach. Now, at the same time, Starlight Runner does geopolitical and sociopolitical um, uh, consultations as well. And we are watching these amazing, dramatic things happen all over the planet. And I don't mean to equate the challenges that Disney's experiencing with Brexit, 
but there is a kind of continuum uh, uh, going on here. We're seeing gigantic brands just suddenly vanish. Um, uh, Kodak, Sears, SeaWorld, Abercrombie & Fitch. Um, uh, we're sp seeing the development of spontaneous, leaderless, self-organized social systems uh, like the Arab Spring and Black Lives Matter manifest almost out of nowhere um, and, and do it really, really quickly. Um, uh, 32,000 people seem to have a stranglehold, or seemed at least to have a stranglehold over the entire world. Uh, in, in the ISIS uh, organization. And this dude who was like orange, <laughs> who had a reality show, is suddenly running the planet. <laughs> um, how is this happening? <laughs> well, to me, it's the difference between the circle of the hero's journey and the lightning bolt of this new modality of storytelling. Um, uh, so, in, in, um, in less than 20 years, um, something uh, striking has happened. You know, the hero's journey um, is extraordinarily valid. Let's not um, uh, deny its power. Um, it, it was basically a, a, a kind of mindset that kept you alive in, in uh, primitive times. Um, Males departed the safety of the home to uh, gain sustenance or um, people. <laughs> and, um, and they entered the wild and they risked life and limb. And they returned with food, fire, and sometimes people. <laughs> um, and, um, and this little uh, uh, circle was memorialized by tribal communicators. Um, uh, and, um, and it was done in this circle uh, where it, it was participative and messy, uh, but it, it was this eternal return, right? Um, it, it was this um, uh, uh, cycle of survival that became locked into our psyches and inhabits every story. Just about every story you are ever exposed to has some variation uh, on this uh, kind of circle. Uh, the call to adventure, crossing the thresholds, um, uh, getting these revelations, um, uh, 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 fighting and uh, conquering your enemies so that you can take the boon, return to your people, and grant it to them, and they are saved. Well, um, how is that serving us now? Um, well, um, when you did that back then, you tended to be relatively isolated. And, uh, and you had to be right. If you were not right about this story, you're kind of dead. <laughs> um, so uh, what would happen is sometimes when two tribes would meet uh, one another, one from down in the valley, one from up in the mountains, they were both right, at least from their point of view. And that fomented conflict. Who's really right-er? And um, uh, so um, this kind of uh, survival of the fittest engine um, uh, yielded uh, some conflict sometimes. Um, and, um, and now that we're all so crowded, now that we're on top of each other, now that um, the space in between is connecting us all, we are tribalizing and running into each other at times ramming into each other head first, and this is creating serious conflict um, uh, across the internet, and that spills out into reality. So here is the drama and disquiet that I feel about the hero's journey model that we need to watch out for. Um, uh, I'm gonna go through these quickly, so um, if you want the details, I'll tell you where to, to, to get them. But essentially, the model is driven on conflict, right? Every screenwriting teacher will tell you conflict, conflict, conflict. I, I, you even need to have conflict within the same page, or else the audience could get bored. Conflict. The model is weighted on masculine impulse. I said he for a reason. Um, uh, it's, um, conflict is naturally perceived of as, as masculine, and there's aggression and violence, this sense of rightness. 
um, uh, uh, the imposition of values and order, the status quo, um, is uh, a part of this hero's journey. Um, the narrative is linear, right? Beginning, middle, end, that's it. Um, uh, a singular villain is favored over a systemic change, right? You, you, you had to defeat the bad guy before it was over or the audience won't be satisfied. The problem is the system that birthed that villain usually remains unaltered. Um, there is this uh, good versus evil binary, right? We defeat the bad guy and we feel good about it. Um, and um, uh, uh, that e even if you shade it, there is still this kind of good versus bad uh, situation, particularly in popular culture. And I know there are exceptions to all of this. I'm really speaking broadly and generally. The feminine, this pisses me off, is temptress, innocent or goddess, um, all three of which are complements to the issue of the hero. Um, and, um, and don't tell me about the Buffies and the Xenas and the Wonder Womans. They tend to be stand-ins for, for male figures. They're kick-ass. Oh, don't you love when in the first act of anything, the dude chucks the phone against the wall and it's over, right? Uh, the hero's journey is not conducive to communications technology because that would solve the problem in five minutes. <laughs> oh, God. People. Hollywood. Um, the narrative is built on knowledge scarcity, right? Um, uh, usually the hero doesn't know something and needs to know it. Uh, and runs around willy-nilly when the answers to the universe are in his pocket. Um, uh, there is the celebration of heroic power and glory, right? We elevate our heroes. Um, but in the end, the hero loses. Why? Because they make this tremendous sacrifice and they go back to the community, and they're never really the same, right? All these adventures have caused them to see the world in a different way, which sort of puts them outside of uh, uh, their community, and they float away to the Grey Havens or, or what have you with their nine fingers. Um, <laughs> spoilers, sorry. Um, and guess what? The community loses. Why? because they're waiting for the hero to win. And if he doesn't, they're destroyed. They're wiped out, they're gone. And in the absence of the hero, sometimes they'll look for somebody who seems like one, but who is eminently unqualified. So something's happened, something's changed, and it's awesome. It's dangerous but it's awesome. When you are able to express yourself online, you're not just expressing yourself on Facebook. You have four or five different social media outlets each, right? Maybe more sometimes. And you are slightly different on each one of those things. And the audience that you're speaking to might, be, uh, might overlap, but also is, is slightly different. Um, uh, when I'm on Instagram, I'm all dreamy. <laughs> I'm traveling the world so lonely. <laughs> when I'm on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm kind of business dude, super successful. When I'm on Xbox, I'm talking trash and, and doing battle with you. Um, Facebook is kind of a mishmash of happy, happy joy, um, and, uh, and Snapchat, I have no idea because I can't seem to make it work. Um, uh, but, um, you know, when I get a bug up my ass, if I'm really, really riled about something, I'm going to communicate that, maybe in slightly different ways, to all five or six or seven of those communities. And I have a little sway, 
you know, I've got 20, 25,000 followers all together, and I can get them excited and make them like do shit, um, and and um, and think about that. That is a kind of fractal expression of my will, and somebody, or maybe many people in those sub communities, are going to carry that will forward, and this creates powerful waves that radiate out of me. I become something like a broadcaster all by myself. And that can move people. That can, that can do things. And I don't have to leave the house. I don't have to defeat a villain. I don't have to um, uh, 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 get a mentor um, and cross thresholds. Um, I'm just a dude. Um, and, um, and so something's shifted because I'm still telling stories. I'm still involved in storytelling, a kind of mutual storytelling that's going on here. So we've been told what to believe for the, the, the past couple of centuries by our mass media, but not anymore. Things are happening before our eyes that are different from what we're being told, and we can call you out on it. Um, we feel more knowledgeable, more progressive, yet we can also cherry pick the stories that reaffirm our beliefs. When we feel heard, we become capable of doing things we uh, uh, always thought were impossible. Listening becomes a big part of storytelling. We don't need a hero because we are realizing that we're empowered to save ourselves. Um, uh, I need good, clear information in order to kind of sense-make properly and progress and do these things. Um, and I need you to surprise me with a third kind of great idea made out of two lesser ideas. What all this adds up to is that human beings, through social media, have found self-determination. At least they believe they have. <laughs> this is super, super important, self-determination, particularly with regard to what every one of us does uh, in this room. This leads me to a new modality of storytelling, uh, an evolution of the hero's journey uh, that we at Starlight Runner call collective journey. Collective journey is that lightning bolt as opposed to the circle of the hero's journey. Um, the traditional hero's journey model of storytelling has been impacted by the rise of highly accessible digital media, pervasive communications. Uh, but what few of us understand is how profoundly this new modality is affecting us. At the heart of this change is the fact that story has become multilateral. Okay, it's omnidirectional as opposed to linear. It's uh, subject to extraordinary scrutiny. We have the ability, if we're educated enough, to study every tiny frame, every word, to parse every word of what's being uh, given to us. We become uh, capable of creating variations on story across different media platforms. There is an architecture for dialogue built into any and every story being told today. And if you ignore that, you've got problems um, because story is alterable and story is now porous. You can impact the story that I'm telling in a heartbeat. And if I don't recognize that, I can get into serious trouble. Pepsi, United, Fox, every dude who ever touched a woman in the wrong way around the world, they've got problems because story is now a two-way street. So in short, we are now living in a vast communal narrative which leverages self-determination. Those who understand how to initiate and direct these narratives will find extraordinary power extraordinary influence. So the traits of the collective journey include the following. The protagonist is one of a collective. We don't need to be super special. There is no more reason to be the chosen one. Any one of us um, uh, can have a serious impact 
on the narrative. The narrative doesn't necessitate one of my parents dying <laughs> in order for me to proceed. Um, uh, there doesn't have to be terrible trauma. Something can happen that's just not right. <laughs> Um, and we can be driven by a cause. The narrative is weighted toward a non-gendered impulse. I don't mean necessarily just feminine, I just mean that there is a spectrum of attitudes and personae through which we can proceed um, that doesn't necessitate the classic uh, archetype of the masculine warrior hero. The challenge can be huge or pervasive. Think about some of the most successful um, uh, fictional narratives going on television these days. Game of Thrones, Orange is the New Black, The Walking Dead. These things are about huge systemic uh, problems and a bunch of characters who are caught up in those systemic problems who are generally kind of killing each other or, or, or beating each other up, but really, what they have to do is realize that the system is flawed, unite and uh, 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 fix the system. Um, and hopefully in all three of those narratives, they will eventually, more or less, um, and that will be satisfying and epic at the same time. Uh, of course, it applies in real world uh, situations as well. The narrative may be non-linear, and any of us who are uh, developing these game worlds, the video game worlds, understand the fact um, that it's, um, it's less and less satisfying to just kind of move in a linear way through um, uh, these game environments. There are multiple perspectives and shifting viewpoints in collective journey uh, uh, stories. And um, in, in doing so, we're getting theme and variation. We're getting insight um, uh, that is um, less about asserting rightness and more about comparing perspectives. Super, super important. We are learning that once we do compare these perspectives, that when we combine them in certain ways, there is strength, there is power. We are more likely to heal the system uh, by moving away from the binary and toward the juxtaposition of ideas. There is strength in diversity. We don't need an old dude to tell us the information. Um, uh, mentorship is now distributed. We can reach out to anybody who has the expertise and they uh, more than likely are willing to share their knowledge, their wisdom in order for us to move through the situation. The narrative can be highly immersive. It's not just about text. It's not just about image. It's about um, uh, multiple media platforms and us moving through um, and enjoying the, the narrative uh, in a transmedial way. The narrative is conducive to pervasive communications. We may have to be a little more clever, but let's stop throwing away the mobile phone or going out of reach of the towers or whatever. Um, the approach is networked. Uh, each of us has the ability to reach out at any time and tap into a kind of collective intelligence to help us get done what needs to get done. The narrative is built on knowledge abundance. Um, it's all out there, and we are willing, just like I'm doing here today, to share that knowledge so that we can uh, raise the waters and float all boats. At the end of the collective journey, the hero wins, right? Um, uh, that's because they have not decimated themselves to get the job done they're still with their friends, they're still with their community, um, and therefore they can rejoin the community because we haven't elevated them into some special space that requires worship. Um, uh, they're our, our bud, they're our friend, they're our companion, our family member, our community member. They've done uh, good work, but so have we in support of this common effort. And of course, um, the community wins uh, because um, we don't need a hero. No one's coming to save us. We've saved ourselves. 
and uh, therefore can perpetuate ourselves and, um, and not risk uh, the horror of, of having a, a terrible leader in charge while the heroes uh, have gone away. So in short, we don't need violence. Um, you just need to show us that you're listening. Your storytelling and the games that you create need to empower us to impact a system, okay? Um, uh, now, uh, this isn't just hippy-dippy bullshit. Um, there, is, there can be violence, there can be conflict. It's just that it's not um, uh, exalted. It, it is a part of a palette that you have um, uh, that um, uh, can allow for you to tell richer, uh, more sophisticated stories that validate and celebrate participation. Back to Disney. So how does Collective Journey uh, impact uh, uh, the Disney parks and resorts in a way that kind of gamifies the experience? Well, um, Disney is implementing uh, Collective Journey modality into large portions of the parks, and I'll bet you uh, after a series of phases that this uh, approach will subsume uh, uh, all of the uh, Disney parks. Um, listening is the key. But then again, they have those little Mickey Mouse bracelets, those RFIDs. Um, boy, can they tell a lot about what you're doing and where you are through those things. Um, and when you combine them with the perception of trained performers, um, basically, the Walt Disney Co Company can become the dungeon master to your <laughs> experience. They're listening and watching what it is that you're doing and what it is that you're deciding um, in, in these atmospheres and, um, and moving uh, in such a way that, um, that responds to what you're doing and saying. Um, these branching narratives allow for exploration, discovery, and interaction. Um, each guest um, is, is granted uh, something special. So you can be a kid in a family and your, your sister could be five feet away from you but your experience of what's going on in, in this part of the park could be completely different from hers. So at the end of the day, you can talk about your experience and she could talk about hers, and it's, it's different, there, it's, and, and it'll be surprising. And they may want to experience what happened to each other um, tomorrow, which helps with um, uh, wanting to kind of come back and re-experience these things. Um, uh, mobile technology, the phone, um, there, it used to be that you couldn't use your mobile phone in a Disney theme park. It was like, <sighs> terrible. Um, now, you can, uh, you can use it. And, um, and there's going to be content offered to those phones to occupy, um, uh, 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 raise uh, the issue of mysteries and um, uh, introduce people to new intellectual properties while they're waiting uh, in the parks. Guests can talk, touch, and play with, but more importantly, somehow impact the story world. They will see, you'll see that you'll be able to cause a character to make a, a decision um, that uh, affects how the rest of your experience unfolds. It's really kind of cool. Um, um, uh, I call these, these things narrative subroutines. Narrative subroutines are, are aspects of story that are not overt, that are not jumping out at you, but that if you're perceptive, you can pick up clues and traces of no matter where you are in the park, and they help to add to the story. They give you more information. Uh, they, they allow for you to, um, uh, to make small discoveries that contribute to your sense of satisfaction with what's going on. Um, and, and finally, these mythologies are threaded throughout the parks so that even if you're in an area of the park that you're not that crazy about, little hints and clues about stuff that you do like are, are woven into the seams of uh, that part of the park, too. So you can go, oh, I see something. Um, this is going to be useful when I get back to 
uh, Star Wars land or Pandora or, or what have you. Um, uh, we're seeing this in Pandora and, and Star Wars sections, but they are spreading uh, across the parks. Um, and uh, of course, what I just described is something that is uh, costing uh, many millions of dollars and is taking some years to develop. Is there any relevance to what it is that you're doing? I say yes. And here's an example. Meow Wolf. Um, some of you may have heard of this um, art collective in um, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, it's amazing. It's a bowling alley. And a collective of uh, up to 100 artists have created an installation there that uh, becomes a kind of immersive experiential uh, scenario. Um, and, uh, and so you walk into uh, Meow Wolf and, um, and you're into, you, you, you become a, uh, involved in a hub to the nexus of several different realities. And there's a mystery about a family that's gone missing um, in, in this uh, 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 nexus that you have to try and unravel. It's uh, uh, fascinating. It, it costs 10 or 15 bucks to, to experience. It takes hours to navigate the whole thing. Um, uh, and then you can uh, buy refreshments at the juice bar. Um, so these powerful experiences are scalable, applicable to theatrical escape rooms, artistic installations, arcades, and more. Um, listening becomes the key, um, and, um, and Meow Wolf doesn't have RFIDs, but they have uh, performers who are super trained to observe and follow what it is that you're doing, and they have like a, a battery of monitors to, to watch people as they move through the experience. Uh, their branching or evolving narratives allow for exploration, discovery, interaction, each, each guest um, has the same kind of subjective participatory experience. Um, they're developing transmedia content that can be used in their marketing and advertising to give you some clues and hints before you even get there. And then after uh, the experience is done, you can go back to those things and try and puzzle through uh, more of the mysteries and, and um, uh, uh, story elements after you're done. Um, uh, so you can talk and play with and interact and impact that story world just as you can with, with Disney, perhaps even more. Uh, these narrative subroutines are, are, are also woven throughout Meow Wolf, and you're rewarded. Um, uh, the more you, you look, the more you search through this massive uh, of art, um, you become uh, more deeply involved. You learn and find out more about those uh, uh, mysteries. So um, it's scalable, what it is that I'm talking about. Um, I want to wrap up by saying that, um, that stories uh, can affect change. Um, uh, and you can use um, a collective journey narrative to get people to um, uh, really strongly consider um, uh, new ideas or ideas that that kind of they have in their hearts but have floated away from because um, uh, you know the atmosphere has become like toxic and um, and you can get them to kind of stand together and stand up and and promote progressive positive uh, uh, values um, Starlight Runner has done this in the real world um, across entire countries. We've done this in Mexico with the Hagamos Bien uh, uh, program that um, promoted lawfulness in an uh, atmosphere where uh, the cartels and corruption have uh, created um, a deadly uh, environment. We helped to promote the peace process and entrepreneurialism in Colombia. Um, uh, we're working with World Vision uh, to bring collective journey narrative to reframe uh, the relationship that donors have with um, the people that we're helping uh, uh, overseas. Um, it's, it's really, really something that has been tested and does work. Um, it's, it's quite thrilling. Um, you can learn more about Collective Journey at blog.collectivejourney.com, uh, um, where I go into some detail. 
the series is not finished. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I should be done with it by the end of uh, uh, the year. And, uh, and let me just tell you, great storytellers listen. Listening is the first step to engaging the millions who now thrive in that gray space in the middle. Thank you so much. Thank you.